Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions during this presentation today, please type them in, into the questions tab of the GoToWebinar menu and we will answer them at the end of the presentations. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. I'd like to welcome everybody to the May 26th uh, edition of Crop Talk. And uh, on today's Crop Talk, uh, we have uh, few things going on. We uh, have uh, a lot of canola that's starting to come through the ground and starting to get some calls regarding uh, flea beetles. So I thought it would be good to get uh, John Gavoski on and go through a little bit of a flea beetle update and uh, what to expect and what we can do to uh, manage uh, manage these guys. Uh, then after that, um, the forecast has been a little bit scary the last couple of days with uh, the possibility of frost. Uh, there was some frost reported last night in some areas, and so I thought it'd be good to maybe talk about potential frost and problems that may cause and kind of given us uh, a heads up on what we uh, uh, can expect if we do get the frost. And uh, so I have Dane uh, Fraze and Dennis Lang on, and they're going to go through uh, canola and uh, some of the pulse crops as uh, those are the ones that are probably the ones that we could maybe have uh, more damage uh, or see more damage in. And then after that, uh, the crop scouting panel, we have uh, some questions that have come in this past week and we'll try to get all those answered. So uh, with that, just a couple slides before we get into John's presentation, uh, our seeding progress. And when you look at uh, where we are right now, uh, we're sitting right around 91% uh, complete uh, for uh, the, the fourth week of May, and uh, which is uh, pretty much right on, on our average and, uh, and ahead of last year. Um, one of the things I've uh, been surprised to see in some of my travels is that uh, we're seeing a lot of quick emergence of, uh, of a lot of crops and even surprised in some of the dry conditions. But uh, I think it was those couple of days when we got uh, some really warm uh, conditions, uh, warm uh, temperatures, and a lot of those crops uh, that uh, were able to take advantage of the moisture was in, that was in the ground and uh, jumped up fairly quick. Uh, we're going to see in the next couple of weeks here probably uh, uh, a lot of quick growth. We uh, got uh, quite a few areas received uh, moisture over the last uh, three to four days here and if we get some heat we're going to see crops uh, coming up and jumping fairly fairly fast and that's going to keep everybody busy because the next big step uh, is to uh, finish uh, finish seeding and uh, and then get the sprayers going because there was a lot of burn off that wasn't uh, able to be done because of the uh, wind and then because of the wet conditions. Um, also uh, with that uh, just going to throw out a, bit, a little bit of a caution to everybody that uh, we need to be watching uh, especially now when we go out uh, still thinking we might be able to get a burn off on some of the later seeded crops uh, that uh, a lot of crop is up so make sure your wind conditions are favorable for when you're spraying because uh, we can and we'll see a lot of drift issues uh, if, uh, if we uh, are doing spraying during some of the conditions. Uh, uh, you know, before the crops up, a lot of times wind isn't as crucial as it is right now, and uh, so now with the crops being up, uh, be very careful as you're going out there and uh, and spraying. So where do we sit as to uh, the guys that still have to put some uh, seeds in the ground? Uh, well, we're still, you know, pretty much 80% uh, and above, and most of the crops that probably would have uh, uh, needed to be in early or are in already. So now we're looking at a lot of the crops that uh, uh, are uh, some silage crops. Uh, there's still some canola, but when you look at the canola, we're still, you know, 90, 92% uh, of our, our potential yield is there. So we still are really in a situation where we haven't lost anything on some of the later seeded crops here. So uh, I think uh, as you look at uh, the percentage completed, and uh, and where we're sitting, I think uh, we're uh, we're right on track to uh, where we should be at this time. So those are the few slides I wanted to start with, and I think now we'll get into uh, John's presentation on our flea beetle update. Okay, can you guys see my slides, uh, Lionel? 
I can see your. Oh, you probably can, right? You bet, yeah. Okay, awesome. So what we're going to cover today, I'm going to, I've got my presentation broken down into three parts. We'll do a, a bit of an introduction to flea beetles, go over a little bit of their biology. I want to cover some of the factors that increase your risk of getting economic injury by flea beetles and potentially some of the um, cultural practices you can do to maybe reduce that risk a little bit. And then I'm going to cover estimating percent defoliation. This is something that's critical to evaluating uh, whether a foliar insecticide is needed, but it's not something that's easy to do. So we'll go over how to uh, do a good job estimating percent defoliation. And just be warned, uh, there are a few questions embedded in my presentation. So uh, if you weren't expecting a surprise quiz today, surprise, um, there are a few questions, and I've highlighted a few things in red that uh, I think are probably the key take-home messages. And uh, just to begin with, with flea beetles, uh, for most canola growers, they know striped, and they know crucifer flea beetle, but flea beetles are actually a fairly big group of insects. There's 72 different species of them in Manitoba. Uh, there's a, a, a handful that feed on canola. There's uh, some that feed on other crops like potatoes. And you are reading the third bullet point, right? There are actually some beneficial flea beetles. So before I finish my introduction section, I'll show you uh, some flea beetles that actually are beneficial and actually do look somewhat like the ones we see feeding on canola. Uh, what defines flea beetles? They're generally tiny insects with big, uh, large femurs on their back legs. So they're very good at jumping very quick and uh, um, almost resemble a flea, both by being small and jumping. Now, I mentioned there's several species that feed on canola. There's actually 10 species that have been documented to feed on canola, but really there's two species we consider pests, and they do differ slightly. Uh, there's the striped flea beetle. Appearance-wise, they're easy enough to tell if you've got good eyes. If you look on the back, the striped flea beetle uh, has two yellow stripes on the back. Crucifer flea beetle is more solid back, uh, black. Now, early in the season, uh, in April and early May in Manitoba, most of what you see is striped flea beetle. That is the early season species. They emerge anywhere from about one to four weeks earlier than crucifer flea beetle. So that's the one you see early on. As we get into later May, a bigger proportion of the population becomes crucifer flea beetles. And there has been a little bit of a shift in populations, and I'll explain in a minute why that is occurring. Uh, we are seeing overall more striped flea beetles than we used to, and fewer crucifers. But still, once we get into late May, early June, uh, the crucifer flea beetles are still um, a large part of the population. Both these flea beetles are introduced. The striped flea beetle, probably somewhere um, late 1600s, so it's been around a long time. Uh, the crucifer flea beetle more recently. So they're both introduced species. They're not native species of flea beetles. Um, so uh, with them being introduced species, people have looked at things such as biocontrol, but to date there's really nothing effective that uh, works on them biocontrol wise. So the first question for you is regarding insecticides and particularly the seed treatments. And there was a study done in Alberta. Uh, Jim Tanzi and Lloyd Dosto did some work um, looking at neonicotinoids and they found that they caused higher mortality so they killed more crucifer flea beetles than they did striped flea beetles. So the question I have is, does that mean that flea beetles are resistant to the neonicotinoid seed treatments? So your options here are yes, no, not sure, and all of the above. And the answer is, there's, there's really no evidence that the, the difference in susceptibility is resistance. Um, I mentioned there's lots of different types of flea beetles. And it, 
within a group of insects, insecticides don't work equally effective on all different species. And so it just happens to be that uh, the neonics work better on crucifer, a little bit less on striped. You, stu you still do get control of striped flea beetles, but not to the same degree that you do the crucifer. As far as we know, there's been no genetic change in the beetles. For something to be true resistance, there has to be a genetic change that occurred in the insect to make it more resistant to the insecticide. So a, a genetic change occurring over time. And as far as we know, there's no evidence to support that. So it's just uh, greater tolerance to the neonics by the striped than the crucifer flea beetles. Um, now, whether or not this is causing this greater abundance of uh, striped flea beetles, uh, it's hard to say, but right now that's what people are, are speculating could be happening uh, because striped is a little bit more um, tolerant to the neonics than the crucifer flea beetle. Uh, they might be surviving a little bit better. And across the prairies, we have seen overall, um, when, we, when we compare historical data, there's a greater proportion of the population now is striped than it was a few decades ago when people started uh, taking survey data like this. And you will see the adults twice. There's, there's actually only one generation of flea beetles per year for the striped and crucifer, but you do see the adults twice. And the adults that you're seeing right now are the exact same adults that were present last August and September. They overwinter as adults, so you see that August-September population that comes out. They overwinter, and it's the exact same flea beetles that are present the following spring. And eventually they're going to start dying out, but usually uh, it's into June. Usually by about late June, the population of adults has really collapsed. Um, and then it's just uh, larva in the ground. But the crucifer flea beetle doesn't really start peaking in its populations till about late May. So late May, early June, you can almost count on there being high populations. Somewhere around mid-May, sorry, uh, mid-June, populations will start going down. And by late June, uh, usually the adult population has really dwindled out. And then they're larva in the ground. And if you've ever wondered what the other stages of flea beetles look like, the eggs are microscopic. This photo was taken through a microscope uh, by a researcher at the University of Manitoba. They're tiny microscopic eggs. They hatch out into these uh, very tiny larvae. These larvae feed on the root hairs, maybe to some degree on the tap roots. As far as we know, they're not really causing economic damage to the plant. I don't expect to see these pulling roots the way you do root maggots. They're really tiny larvae, and uh, uh, unless you're digging in the soil around the roots, you probably won't encounter these. They're, they don't burrow into the roots the way root maggots do. And just to wrap up the introduction part, I mentioned that there are some beneficial flea beetles. And here's an example. Uh, this species here is called aphthona. And there's three species that were purposely brought into the Canadian prairies and, and the northern U.S. states, basically anywhere that there's a lot of leafy spurge. These flea beetles feed only on leafy spurge. They've got a very narrow diet. Uh, they're important biocontrols of leafy spurge, and they've been purposely introduced. And uh, every year we get people asking, where can I get some of those spurge beetles for my leafy spurge? They do do a good job. They don't totally wipe out the spurge, but they can certainly reduce the patches somewhat. Um, so they are around. So if you do see uh, your, the leafy spurge uh, in your field edges, ditches, pastures, covered in these black flea beetles, that's not the same ones that will eat your canola. These are good flea beetles, and you want those around. And here's a picture of the larva feeding on the roots of the leafy spurge. Uh, that's probably doing as much, if not more, damage to the uh, leafy spurge as the adult feeding is doing. Okay, so part two of my presentation relates to risk factors for flea beetles. And just to begin with here, um, seedling stages are really what's susceptible and vulnerable. 
there's been a, a few studies looking at the different staging and um, when the plants become a bit more tolerant to the feeding. The generally accepted uh, guideline is that once you get three to four true leaves on the plant, the plants generally can tolerate for the flea beetle feeding quite well. So the first two things that pop out of the ground are the cotyledons. These don't count as true leaves. You need three or four additional true leaves on the plant before we consider it to be um, in, in those more tolerant stages. Until then, it's going to be susceptible to flea beetles. How long it remains susceptible depends on a lot of factors. Now, the other thing to consider uh, is you, every canola seed in the ground probably has a, a seed treatment with an insecticide on it. Uh, a lot of it's probably either Helix or Prosper. Some might be Lumiderm, um, Fortenza. And one of the questions we often get is, how long can I bank on those seed treatments working for me? And there's different things um, published on this. I like to go to the peer-reviewed scientific literature for uh, a guideline. And so Dr. Janet Canolo, she does work at North Dakota State University. She's done quite a bit of work studying uh, flea beetles on canola. And in one of her papers, she uh, mentions that the Helix and Prosper uh, consistently gave about three weeks of protection. And you might get a fourth week if the weather conditions aren't conducive for flea beetles. So generally, bank on getting about three weeks of protection. You might get a fourth, but bank on there being roughly three weeks. And you've got plants that are going to be coming up and trying to get to that three to four leaf stage. So what I've got highlighted at the bottom in red, I've got it in red and I've also got it bolded because this is an extremely important thing to uh, grasp. Slow emergence and early season growth are what's going to make your canola more vulnerable to flea beetles. The clock starts ticking once you seed the crop. So from the seeding date, you've got three to four weeks of protection. And if you can get to the three to four leaf stage, so remember the words three to four. Uh, three to four leaf stage is where it's more tolerant and you've got three to four weeks of protection. You need to get to the three to four leaf stage uh, within three to four weeks, essentially. That's what's critical. If you can do that, you may not have to foliar spray. If it's taking your plants more than three to four leaves to get from the seeding date to the three to four leaf stage, that's when you're going to run into trouble, and that's when you may have to be doing foliar sprays. That's when you have to be out there uh, estimating percent defoliation and deciding do we do these foliar sprays. So that's the challenge, getting to the three to four leaf stage in three to four weeks. Anything that delays the plants, prevents them from getting um, that Quick germination and early growth makes your crop more vulnerable. So that can be seeding into cold soil where the seeds just sit there and don't germinate, uh, seeding into dry soil, which this year uh, many people had to do. If you get a frost on the canola and it just sits in the cotyledon stage for a long time before it really resumes growing, that can set it back and make it more vulnerable to flea beetles. So really anything keeping the plant in those seedling stages for more than three to four weeks is going to increase your risk of needing to foliar spray for flea beetles. And so people have often wondered, well, what if we seed a little bit later um, towards mid-May? Will that decrease our risk? And the short answer is it might. And I've got three studies here. These are the th same three studies we profiled a couple weeks ago in the Manitoba Crop Pest Update. Uh, the first one was done in Manitoba back in the 80s by Bob Lamb, and in their studies, the earlier seeded uh, tests suffered more damage from flea beetles. Um, almost identical study by Jan Canoto, North Dakota, in uh, the early 2000s, same result, early seeded canola suffered more injury. And then Hector Carcamo, uh, Similar experiment in Alberta, roughly about the same time as Jan's study. He got mixed results depending on um, 
where in the province they were uh, taking their measurements. But really, again, it all goes back to that concept that you need to get your plants to a three to four leaf stage in three to four weeks. So if you're seeding into cold soil and things are going to be taking their time, germinating coming up, that's going to increase your risk. You might be lucky. You may seed in late April, early May, get a warm spell with some good moisture, and uh, you escape major flea beetle seeding. That can happen. Um, but again, it depends on the year, and uh, the critical point is uh, you need that quick early season growth. That's what's going to reduce your risk. Uh, the other thing that um, might be increasing the risk somewhat nowadays is seeding rates. Uh, canola seed's expensive, and people don't want to seed, seed at any higher rates than they need to. Um, study done by Lloyd Dostel in Alberta found that the, the mean flea beetle damage per plant uh, actually decreased when they had higher seeding rates, which isn't really unexpected. You've got more plants for the same number of flea beetles. It uh, dilutes out the damage a little bit. Um, and as a, I guess, side benefit to those higher seeding rates, they were also looking at root maggot damage, and they found that the higher seeding rates they usually had less root maggot damage as well. So higher seeding rates um, can help reduce damage somewhat. With really heavy flea beetle populations, it may not be enough to be uh, what we would consider a control, but it might help uh, spread the damage out a bit. Uh, although for selecting seeding rates, there is a lot that goes into it. Uh, there's cost for one. Um, if you see too dense, then you may increase your risk of certain pathogens. Uh, so lots of things to consider regarding seeding rates. And I know the Canola Council's got their recommendations. Um, but if you're using the uh, some lower rates, that might increase the risk somewhat as well. So the third part of my presentation is looking at uh, rating uh, percent defoliation to the cotyledons, which is very tricky to do, but again, essential if you're trying to decide do we need to do a foliar spray? So this is your second question. What percent defoliation is this? So have a look at this. And as you're coming up with your answer, um, a couple things to note. Uh, our eyes are often drawn to the damage and not so much the healthy tissue. There is an overall tendency for people to overrate feeding damage. Uh, some people might look at this and say, that looks horrible, uh, spray the field. Other people might say there's still a lot of healthy tissue there. Um, there's different ways you can uh, uh, assess things. We did an experiment at Crop Diagnostic School several years ago now where we actually had people go out and rate defoliation in some crops. And then we gave them a photo key and had them go and re-rate. And most people had overrated the damage the first time they went out. The second ratings were lower. Oops, I'm going to go back, give you the answer here. Oops, there we go. There's your answer. 25% uh, defoliation. Uh, what they did was use image analysis to measure the amount of uh, healthy tissue versus damaged tissue here. So this is actually 25% defoliation. This is your threshold. This is the point where if on average things are looking like this, uh, it's probably going to be cost effective to use an insecticide. And there are feeding charts and keys to help you um, make better assessments. This one here, Julie Soroka put out. I know the Canola Council has this one posted. Uh, although this one, uh, these aren't the greatest pictures here. This key here is harder to use. This one here is a, probably a bit more uh, user friendly. It's on the Canola Watch uh, website, so you can find it uh, by searching for that, and it does show you on uh, different cotyledons what 20%, 30%, uh, some of the different levels look like. And so if we are in a situation where we're seeing some flea beetle seeding, but it's scattered pits like this here, the question becomes, is this a situation where you need to panic or do you just keep watching the field? So this is 10% defoliation on this cotyledon. 
Now, if you're at this level here, you probably don't need to be spraying if this is as bad as it's going to get. Um, you will even get a little bit of pitting, even if you've got the seed treatments fully functional. The flea beetles do have to feed to ingest the insecticide before they die. So if it's minor pitting like this, uh, don't get too concerned. But once you do start getting closer to that 25%, that's when you need to really start uh, considering your foliar sprays. Now, the other thing that makes it really tricky is flea beetles, aside from feeding on the cotyledons and leaves, they do feed on the stems. So you've got a plant here where you can see this stem has been chewed up. And right now, there's still green tissue here. But a plant like this is not going to take much for that stem just to snap. And then you've lost this whole cotyledon, which at that point will be 100% defoliation. So you have to factor that in. Uh, this cotyledon here is actually 50% defoliation. So that's already quite a high level. Plus, we've got stem feeding. So uh, hopefully, you, you won't get to this point here. But if you do, your crops definitely do need some additional protection, providing that the flea beetles are still actively feeding. So that's the other thing you have to assess is uh, what's the percent defoliation and what's the flea beetle population like this time of year, late May, early June, it's probably around. Now, the other thing that's tricky and you need to consider is on any given day, the flea beetles are going to fluctuate depending on the conditions. So a day like today where it's um, not likely to hit 10 degrees. You probably won't see a lot of flea beetles on the plants. Uh, yesterday, where it was 50 to 60 kilometer an hour winds, even though it was milder, you still likely won't see a lot of flea beetles. Flea beetles like to feed on calm, dry, and warm days. Those are your ideal flea beetle uh, feeding days. Even if it's very humid, they may not be feeding as aggressively or on the plants to the same degree. So the calm, dry, um, warm days, that's when you'll see the very heavy populations. A day like today, is, it would be an, an okay day to be assessing percent defoliation, but you may not get the full scope of uh, what the flea beetle population is like. However, if you are out on a day like today, you still see a lot of flea beetles on the plants and you're above 25%, then you do know we've got a problem and we probably do need to do a full year spray if we're not into that three to four leaf stage yet. So that wraps up what I have to present and I can take any questions if we have any. Any questions, Lionel, or should we move on? Uh, no, sorry, John. I just uh, had a problem getting my mic back, uh, back on here. Um, yeah, there's a couple of questions that have come in. And uh, one question is uh, regarding the stripe and the uh, uh, black beetle. Uh, is there a decision that needs to be made, a spraying decision need to be made regarding spraying for one or spraying for the other? A short answer is no, because right now, um, we, for decision purposes, we treat them almost as the same species. So when you're doing your assessments for the foliation and what's the flea beetle population like in the field, you're looking at both striped and crucifer. There's actually research going on right now where they're trying to look at the differences in feeding between them. Um, does striped flea beetle cause more stem clipping than crucifer? Uh, we, we don't know. Um, uh, is one uh, feeding a bit more economically, um, but we don't have those answers right now. So right now, uh, treat them as the same. And even if we do get those answers, it's going to be tricky to um, make decisions uh, based on species because they are tiny. And if you get close enough, you will see those yellow stripes. But when you're uh, looking over the plants, and you just see a lot of black spots on your uh, cotyledons and they're moving around, it's hard to get a good assessment sometimes as to what the percentage of striped and crucifer is. You can do it, especially if you catch some, um, but it, it is tricky to do. Okay, and uh, regarding insecticides, uh, 
spring and cool conditions or if the conditions are cool will we have effectiveness on the flea beetles or do we lose some Okay, so there's trade-offs here, and it depends on what we mean by cool, and probably it also depends on the other weather factors like wind. Um, the chemicals people mainly use for flea beetles are uh, belong to a group called pyrethroids, so things like your uh, matador, desis, pounce, they're all pyrethroids. They don't work as well when we get into the really hot temperatures, into the high 20s and, and the 30s. Now, the other extreme, when we start getting uh, below about 15 degrees or definitely below 10, the flea beetles aren't going to be as active. They're likely to be spending, at least more of them will be spending time um, off the plants in the soil, and you may not get as good kill on a uh, really cool day. So the, the sweet spot would be somewhere um, 15 to 25 in calm conditions would be your ideal flea beetle spraying day. Um, unfortunately, we get very few ideal days, but if you're at either extreme, you may compromise your control somewhat. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, good presentation, and I think you'll be hanging on for the panel if we get a couple more in uh, yeah. as we go. So, uh, uh, Laurie, I guess what we can do next is we could uh, hand the screen over to Dennis. And what we're going to do now is we're going to get into uh, the potential we've been hearing over the last, next couple of days, or especially this evening, we might get some uh, maybe potential for some frost. So I thought it might be a good idea to get uh, Dennis and Dane to come on and talk a little bit about frost and what we might expect in, uh, in some of the pulse crops with Dennis and with canola with uh, with Dane. So uh, Dennis, you take it away first. Thanks, Lionel. Um, so I guess the first picture that you see up on my screen right now is a soybean plant that had a little bit of frost damage to it. You can see the leaves here uh, uh, kind of wilting here. And, um, you know, this is probably further advanced than where we are currently right now. A um, couple things to kind of keep in mind when it comes to frost damaged uh, soybeans, and that's the main one I'm going to be talking about because a lot of the dry beans just kind of got planted uh, in the last week, so anything that's in the soil is, is going to be pretty good uh, with, without frost damage. So um, this is something I pulled off of our, our the, the statement I pulled off of our website here. Um, this is my soybeans actually that are just poking through the ground here. Um, you know, size does matter when it comes to soybeans. So the smaller they are, the more tolerant they are. Um, while soybeans are sensitive to frost, a, a small plant like this, um, they can take a bit more frost. And if they're just poking through, um, you can even see that, you know, minus 2.8 for a few hours is something that they can take. So I, I, I wouldn't be overly concerned uh, unless we're starting to get down to minus four, minus five tonight. Um, so what do you see when you when you do that? I'm just gonna advance my slide here. There you go. Again, whoops, try it uh, one more time. Yeah, there you go. There it's sensitive. Okay, again, these soybeans probably pretty safe at that minus two range because they're just poking through. Um, now this happens to be a dry bean plant, but if you do get a severe enough frost that it actually clips the plant um, below the main growing point and and or just above soil surface, there's no recovery for that plant. That plant is pretty much done. Um, you're probably not going to see this probably until a few hours afterwards, maybe by mid-afternoon uh, after the frost event, you might start to see a few of these start to show up. Um, but one thing to kind of keep in mind is that soybeans can really regrow. Uh, as you see on the image here, I'm just going to uh, put, show my pointer here. And you can see here, this is the, uh, the terminal butter, the main growing point. That's been clipped off by a frost. Uh, this is growth about four to five days later. So you can see here from the axillary buds, you're starting to get some new growth come from this soybean plant. So that plant will probably be okay and produce and produce a, produce a plant. Um, but what you need to really realize is that, you know, if you do get a frost event, don't just go in and rip it up right away. What you need to do is you need to give it a few days, give it four to five days and, and look for some of that regrowth. Uh, you want to do a stand count. If you're doing using the row method, uh, when you're doing your stand count, here are your uh, measurements for doing a row uh, uh, a stand count. This will equal one one thousandth of an acre. 
So if you uh, have a 15 inch row spacing, and I mean 15 inch in, in, a, in a row spacing, you're measuring 34 feet, 10 inches, doing the count. Um, and then if you're, you should be getting somewhere in that, you know, one, ideally you want to be between 120 or sorry, 140 to 160,000 plants per acre. That's your ideal stand. Um, if you do your stand count and you're in that in that uh, in that range and it's you know all, and they're all good plants, you're out of the woods, no problem there whatsoever. So losing a few plants isn't the end of the in the end of the world. If you're solid seeding and you want to use the uh, hula hoop method, uh, get yourself a hula hoop that's 28 and a quarter inches. Um, do a few stand counts of what you have left and determine if you're still in that magic range. So the multiplication factor for 20 and a quarter is 10,000. So whatever you're getting, basically, if you're if you're getting uh, in that count, um, let's say you're getting 14 plants, then that's 140,000 plants. So then you're right in that range. The, the MPSC app also is something you can use as well. So the biggest thing here is don't panic. You know, give it a few days, let it regrow, see what happens, and see how much regrowth you have. Um, this is an example here. We actually did an experiment here a number of years ago, and uh, we actually froze these beans. We actually took a tiger torch to them and to see what kind of regrowth we had. So you can see here the healthy plants where that was not touched by any kind of frost. Um, and the plants that were frozen here, you can see that regrowth. So they are definitely going to be further behind if you do get enough of a frost. Um, but from what I've seen so far, I think most of the beans should be okay as long as we don't get anything much below minus, minus three. So um, just something to keep in mind. So that's all I had from uh, from my standpoint here. So. Okay, thanks. And so you're saying the smaller the plant, the more, uh, I guess, is more the stronger it is. So even yeah, the ones that are just, just poking through. Yeah, the ones that are just poking through, uh, they're going to be able to take a bit more frost than the ones that are bigger. But at this point, I really don't think we're seeing much at, or anything at Unifoliate stage yet. We're just kind of poking through right now. So. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dennis. Uh, now we'll uh, turn it over to Dane, and uh, Dane will make a few comments on, uh, I guess, one of our major crops, canola. Thanks, Lionel. Uh, let me just uh, flip on my screen here. Uh, Lori, can you make? Oh, there we go. Thank you. All right. You're able to see my slides? You bet. Okay, uh, so with canola, we'll go through Excuse a couple me, quick things here. You want to put it in um, slideshow mode? There we go. Better? Okay. Perfect. With canola, what you want to do is, is just like Dennis said, wait a little bit before making any rash decisions. Um, frost events take time to show up. Um, you can go out there and look the first six hours after frost. You're not going to see much. Um, and it won't be a full indicator of what symptoms were experienced. And it really depends on how severe the frost was. Obviously, uh, the colder uh, a frost, the more likely that damage is to occur, as well as the time it takes. So you can have a, a minus four frost for 30 minutes to an hour could actually be less damaging than minus two for six or eight hours. Um, but generally, we recommend looking 24 hours after, look for those high risk spots, those hilltops, um, and then compared to your valleys and the flat spots and areas with more or less trash cover. Um, frost is rarely uniform across an entire field, so doing a lot of scouting and uh, stopping at 50 to 100 different points across that field in a W or an X pattern to examine what's happening. Um, come back to those same spots or rewalk that pattern 72 hours or three days later and reassessing for damage and then further after that the, the the actionable decisions tend to come in the three to five or, or actually um, five to ten day range after a frost event if you're looking at the Solar Council information. So uh, that's when uh, new actions will be taken. We want to look at uh, cotyledons and the stems. So you may have to dig them out of the ground a little bit uh, and look at that, that main stem coming out of the ground. Make sure it's not pinched and the seedling is not floppy. That's the case. It really doesn't matter what the cotyledons look like because that uh, growth point is going to be choked off below on that main stem, and we're going to be seeing yield loss as a result. So do do uh, check your plant stand counts. We want to have a minimum of four plants per square foot. Less than that, when we start treading into reseed territory, if 
they aren't surviving and they won't come back, but we'll have some pictures in just a second. And then uh, don't assume the plants are dead. They are quite capable of coming back in many instances, especially if we only experience the light frost. Light frost being zero to about minus two uh, for only a few hours. Now, the first indicators that you might see on a canola stand um, are light, uh, not, not deep green cotyledons, but a very light green. Uh, and it's very pale in, in that sense. So the opposite would be too dark where it becomes water soaked. So it first becomes a very light green color very early on. And then we start seeing those water soaked lesions. So we're looking at the light spots here in the picture uh, where the circle is, you can see the cotyledons are much paler green than some of the new leaf growth that's uh, since happened. Same over there, bottom left, bottom right. So those are your first symptoms or symptoms a little bit later on. Now that we're seeing new growth, our cotyledons are, are a bit faded and aren't quite so healthy looking. So six hours after the frost, we might see uh, droopy water soaked uh, lesions, a very wet type of cotyledon leaf. Um, that's indicative of, of a light frost that's taken off those cotyledons. Likely that the growing point is okay right now, but it's still too early to tell. 36 hours after the frost or a day and a half later, uh, we're starting to see that leaf desiccation. We're seeing dead cotyledons, they're drying down. The stem in this case is starting to pinch off. The growth point is not showing any green, but it may be a little bit too soon to tell. So we do want to wait a little bit longer, perhaps another day or two, see if any new growth is coming, uh, especially if we have decent growing conditions. But this particular plant here would be dead. And then uh, new regrowth. So that same symptom, if we wait a little longer, and we have some nice growing conditions with adequate soil moisture, which most of us have right now, given that we did experience um, fairly broad rains. Although spotty and it's only at the top surface, that is enough for the canola plants to tap into and put on some new growth if we have some warmer conditions. Uh, so five to 10 days after that frost event, those cotyledons are dead. We're seeing new growth on the leaf coming from that uh, first leaf and from that apical mare stem putting out new growth. Um, research has shown that Canola plants at the two to four leaf stage tend to be more frost tolerant than those at the cotyledon stage. However, agronomists in the field often note that cotyledons uh, and cotyledon canola is a lot closer to the soil and typically is a little bit more protected by the warming effect that soil might have rather than a larger canola plant, which is now further off the surface and may have more damage to it. Um, Cotyledons also have less energy to regrow than a larger plant, so that may be part of the reason that larger plants tend to survive a little bit better. There's a little bit more biomass there to begin with. And that's uh, what I have on uh, canola and reseed decisions. But Lionel, if you have a moment, I'd like to go through a reseed calculator. Is that okay? You bet. Sure. We got a few minutes. You bet. Okay. So I'm just going to pull this one in. This is uh, published by Manitoba Agriculture. It's a reseed calculator that's been developed based off of crop insurance data. So can you see the spreadsheet on my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Let's maximize that. So what I'm gonna do is just walk through a, a reseed calculator decision. So this is not something to be done within the first 24 hours after seeding. This is more of a four to five days after a frost event. Uh, and after you've done those canola counts to see what's surviving and what's not and what your plant stand density are. That information is going to be necessary to punch in this calculator. So I'm going to pick my own risk area uh, for my own farm just to give you an example. So I'm in risk area 12 uh, in the 32 class category in the Red River Valley. I ensure my crop up to 80 percent. Um, crops canola. These numbers I could adjust. I'm going to leave them at one for now. And that is the probable yield punched in from crop insurance data. Now I could enter an estimated market price for the original crop, if I had it pre-contracted at any price, say I pulled the trigger too soon and I sold it at 12 bucks. Um, but my price now for new crop is, is about 15.50. Enter that there. And now based on the average of, obviously we want a lot more than five um, plant counts, we would hope for closer to 50 to 100 per field. So do each individual field separately. I'm gonna start making up some numbers here. I'll say there was four plants per square foot, one, three, seven, and five. It gives me an average uh, plant count of four plants per square um, square meter in this case. I believe they actually were counting square foot, but um, 
estimated yield there at that point is 17 and a half bushels an acre, certainly a lot lower than what I would expect. Hopefully I could reseed by the first week of June if a frost should arrive by tomorrow. Entering my uh, reseed yield again comes from that crop insurance data. Is the seed <laughs> going to be reimbursing me any? Uh, it really depends on what seed brand you bought. Many brands will reimburse up to half. So I'm going to say about $600 a bag or, or 60 bucks an acre. That'll maybe give me 30 bucks on the good side of things. Uh, my reseed costs, you could enter those or leave them blank as you choose. And then my reseed revenue off of that, uh, that crop gives me a, a benefit of $455.11 an acre. So it says that my reseed decision is likely beneficial given those plant stand counts per square meter. Obviously, if we're looking per square foot, that's um, a lot higher. Um, but per square meter, if an ideal stand would be more like 35, 40, 15, 20, and 15. At that point, still likely to receive, but if I bump that number even higher to what my five to seven plants per square foot, so that's 50 to 70 plants per square meter, and 55, still likely to reseed given the high costs of canola and my high market prices right now. So that's really skewing the calculator in a reseed decision um, given the market price right now. What it's not factoring in is that we're facing a very dry summer and uh, the water might not be there and these, these estimated reseed yield numbers could be overinflated based on environmental conditions. So do take that into account. Okay, and uh, Dane, uh, so where would we go to on the website to find that? For sure, let me pull that up right here. Oops, wrong one. Okay, so this is under the cost of production guides for Manitoba agriculture. Um, I find it's easiest to just Google canola reseed calculator MB ag, and that'll bring you right to it. It's the first Google link, and you can download that. Great. That's what I do. Um, okay. Crop decision reseeding tool. Downloads that Excel sheet for me. There you go. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Dane. And you're going to be hanging on for the panel here because I think there might be a couple questions coming up as well. Sounds good. Good. Okay. So, uh, Laurie, if you could hand the screen back to me. It's uh, coming your way, Lionel. Did you not get the prompt? Uh, just got it now. Okay, okay. good. Good. So before we get to uh, just a second here. Okay, we uh, talked about uh, the potential for frost, and this is what happened last night. So another uh, good uh, tool we have on on our, uh, our website is the uh, temperature readings overnight and the maps that are made up. So uh, if you go to our uh, weather page on the uh, on Manitoba Agriculture for tomorrow morning, when we look at what the temperatures were, you could see where just uh, North uh, or south of Rhiney Mountain National Park, there was an area that got just below zero and uh, then up between the lakes as well. And then a small pocket just in the in the central area, but nothing there that would have been uh, critical or would have done any damage, I wouldn't believe so. Uh, but uh, be interesting to check the map out tomorrow and see what it's going to bring. So what we'll do now is we're going to go to our crop scouting panel and we're going to look at a few of the things that uh, popped up this past week and see if we could uh, get some answers to uh, to some of the things that were going on. So uh, first one I'm going to throw out to, uh, I'm going to throw it out to Dave Kaminsky, uh, John, John Hurd, uh, or anybody else that wants to uh, uh, chime in on it. Uh, we were noticing uh, in the last week several fields that were showing uh, yellowing uh, and we're just wondering what might be causing this. Uh, most of the fields that I seen or I was in were barley fields. I'm not sure if that had anything to do with it or not. But uh, so uh, can I get some comments from, uh, so let's say David Kaminsky uh, or, or John Hurt? 
All right, I'll start, Lionel, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Well, um, as you can see by the picture, it looks like a fairly low uh, trash or low residue situation. And uh, when we have that, we get extremes of temperature right at the soil surface. Uh, they may be cold, they may be hot. In, in this case, I expect it was hot, um, and there was that day a little over a week ago now when we had temperatures in the upper 20s. And uh, for delicate emerging plants like that, um, you can have temperatures at the soil surface going up to nearing 50 degrees Celsius. So that uh, provides a little bit of a scorch, and you get a banded effect if that occurs repeatedly. Um, when it cools off at night, the plant continues to grow and you get alternating bands of uh, yellow and green. Now, if it was cold temperature, <clears throat> we'd more likely expect to see some purple coloration. And uh, that is, I don't know, maybe John will talk about that one because there may be a little bit of a phosphorus link, a temporary inability to take it up. In any case, those uh, red or purple colors are anthocyanin pigments. Um, chlorophyll, the green pigment, is dominant. And whenever it uh, disappears for any reason, the anthocyanins beneath are unmasked. Um, so those are my comments. And maybe I'll turn it over to John for other possibilities. Well, uh, thanks, Dave. I, I was just throwing in a contrarian opinion on that. And when I see stuff that yellow, it reminds me of when corn's growing in July and it's uh, been growing through a slow period and all of a sudden it gets really warm temperatures and it pokes out a leaf from the rural and it's yellow. And it's because it just hasn't been exposed to sunlight to develop chlorophyll. And I'm wondering, looking at this barley, maybe it's been developing, but it's uh, it was so dry that it really hadn't done much extension of the coleoptile, it got the warmth, it got some moisture, it poked up, and lo and behold, the, the, the parts below not yet been exposed to uh, uh, sunlight yet, so they're staying yellow temporarily. I think uh, if you went back in two days, uh, Lionel, I, I'm betting that things would be greener. But uh, I, I, I like the looks, great picture, but I, I look at this, and this is cosmetic. No problem here. And uh, I guess I'll just make a final comment on this one. Uh, uh, I did go back uh, yesterday late in the afternoon and it definitely wasn't as noticeable anymore. A lot of the, I, I, my phone was just about dead so I couldn't get a good picture. So, but uh, the plants were, uh, the plants were, you know, improving substantially. Uh, and uh, we haven't had a lot of uh, warm weather since, so maybe just a little slower growth. So I think, yeah, it uh, might be that uh, uh, what John is saying about the, uh, uh, you know, the chlorophyll not still are developing in the plant as well yet. Okay, so thanks, guys. Uh, this one is for Dane. Uh, being that we're going to be in a situation where we might see some frost damage. I thought this would be a good slide to bring up because people might get this uh, confused with uh, what might happen after tomorrow morning. So Dan, can you make a few comments? For sure. Um, seeing that halo effect or flash on canola is actually a good sign. That means you have a seed treatment on your canola and the seed treatment is working. Um, that is uh, part translocation movement of that seed coat treatment onto the growing stem tissues of the plant. So as it emerges, it brings a little bit of that seed treatment with it. It just has a bit of a yellow flash effect. There is no effect on yield at that point, and that's not something to be concerned about. It's just a bit of a visual shocker, um, but it means you have a seed treatment, and it means it's working. Great, thanks, Dane. Uh, next question to Kim Brown. Um, What's the best way uh, to control scouring rush? Um, and is it uh, is it similar to horsetail? There is uh, one thing that has been growing, especially some producers have been telling me, uh, or showing me in the ditches uh, on our field edges, and they're wanting to see if there's something to go and get do about it. So Kim can you make a few comments about that. 
Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Lionel. And those are some good pictures there. We've got some different things going on there. Um, basically, in Manitoba, there's 13 different species of what we commonly call field horsetail or scouring rush. Um, I just call them all equisetum. That's the family name. They're ancient plants. These actually reproduce by spores. They're very, very old plants. And so we see them where there's wet. And, and even if you see them in a dry area, they have very, very deep roots. Like they go 12 to 20 feet deep. Um, huge root system underneath ground and they are finding water somewhere as even if you see them in what appears to be a relatively dry area. So we'll see them in field edges. They will move fairly far into the field, especially if there is good water available for them. They're really hard to kill. Um, with our traditional herbicides, uh, you can spray all the glyphosate in the world on that thing and you're not going to kill it. So MCPA does about the best job you're going to get. Um, Amitrol, which is still available in the system, there's not a lot of it out there. That was a good chemistry to work on it in the ditches and that type of thing, but not um, necessarily in fields. Um, but so if you do can get your hands on some Amitrol, possibly you could try that. I have heard too that Aralex does quite a good job on it. I have not seen that myself, but um, given that it's a group four like MCPA, I would think that that would be something to try. So if you're able to use uh, some chemistry that would combine um, Aralex and MCPA, say in one of our cereal crops, then that would be where I would go after that. But um, yeah, glyphosate's just going to doesn't even really do anything to it. Liberty 2 will, or glufosinate will kind of turn it black, but it seems to come back. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a perennial plant um, because, of, well, the root system is perennial. Some of these new shoots come up every year, but you're dealing with a massive root system underground. And it's really the fact that you have lots of water in that area is why that's there. Okay, thanks. Uh... Kim, and we'll go to uh, the next question for uh, Dennis Lang. Uh, one of the crops that's been up and growing fairly fast is peas, and I just thought it would be a good idea to go through some staging of peas because, uh, and actually for Kim as well, sorry, uh, because uh, we need to be aware that they're uh, growing fast. They may not be tall, but they're definitely going through a lot of stages. So if you guys want to take that one away. Yeah, I'll start off here. Uh, Lionel, can you uh, uh, share my screen here? Or allow me to share my screen. I just got a quick slide to show here. Okay, Lori. Yep, you know it. Okay, so um, just wait till this pulls up here, and we'll go back to pointer mode here. And okay, so the one biggest thing you need to really look at is we do have staging uh, restrictions when it comes to spraying. Um, we can't be spraying past the sixth node stage. And one thing to really kind of keep in mind in these, this image that you see here, peas have what have scale nodes, which can be either just below or just above the soil surface. When you're counting nodes for spraying, counting, uh, what you need to count is, you need to count any of these, what they call scale, or the, the, the stipules. So these clasping leaves or the big banana leaves, uh, banana ear leaves, count those ones as your starting point. So here, this would be, Kind of at that first node stage, the second node hasn't well quite, hasn't quite opened, but you're counting any fully expanded um, uh, stipules that are here. You do not count the uh, scale nodes. So there is a little bit of depending on which literature you look at. Uh, some of the chemical companies use true leaves, and this is what's referred to true leaves. So uh, be in there on time. Don't look at per se the height of the plant because uh, that can be very deceiving, and peas can grow re relatively quickly. Uh, between that second and sixth node stage is where uh, the, some of the main products like Odyssey uh, is recommended to spray. So just keep those things in mind. Thanks. Okay, hey, thanks, uh, Dennis. Um, Kim, do you have any comments you want to make or did that cover it? Uh, no, that, that's, the, uh, that's great. It's really tough to stage peas, I find, when they're really small. And I think, I know I've worked with a lot of farmers. We've, you know, we really have to watch that um, staging. A lot of guys are doing those drive-bys on peas and they're pretty short. <clears throat> they don't realize 
how many nodes <clears throat> we are getting at that time. So I've seen six node Ps that are very, very short because of growing conditions. And we really have to watch um, the, that nodal stage because of our herbicides. Um, the majority of our herbicides have to be on basically by six nodes and you start to incur some damage and you'll see some crop yellowing and that type of thing and you'll set your plants back a bit if you go beyond that six node stage so sometimes our plants are short um, but they're at the right physiological stage for spraying and sometimes there's not a lot of weeds there but you really have to kind of make that decision to spray uh, the plants at the right stage and um, and just go ahead and, and spray um, even though they do appear to be small at the time, they are at the right stage for spraying. So just watch your peas because that's caught us several times over the last few years because of growing conditions. Hey, thanks, guys. Um, great, Laurie, way to be ahead of me. Good, thanks. Um, okay, uh, just a few slides to finish up for today. Uh, field crop protection guides. Uh, Going to be needing these. Uh, any day now so definitely uh, go and grab one they're available at all the MASC off offices our service centers and then uh, there's the uh, 1-800 number to call if you have questions as well from Manitoba Agriculture uh, I'm gonna go to this one here our ag, ag adaptation specialists uh, and there's uh, I guess the seven of us that are uh, available to help you if you've got questions uh, definitely give us a call and we can help you or find somebody that can and that's it for this week so join us next week June the 2nd and uh, I would imagine by then we'll have 100% or 99% of the crop in by then so thanks for attending and see you again next week <laughs>